The death toll from the bombing of a refugee camp by Nigeria's Air Force continues to climb. The UN launches a record-breaking humanitarian appeal. And straight from Rio Samba Drome, Samba schools prepare for carnival. Africa 54 starts right now. Good evening and welcome. I'm Vincent McCorry. This is Africa 54. We begin in West Africa. Now, the death toll from last weekend's bombing of civilians at IDP camp in northeastern Nigeria has now been put to 236. That's more than four times the original estimate, according to the Associated Press. The Nigerian military says the bombing was an accident and is under investigation. A team of six senior officers of the Nigerian Air Force has arrived in the northeastern Borno state to begin investigating how a military jet could drop two bombs on a camp for displaced civilians. Nigerian Air Force spokesman Ayodele Fomuyiwa told VOA the investigators would submit their findings no later than February the 2nd. It's not clear whether the findings will be made public. In East Africa, at least four soldiers were killed and five wounded on Tuesday when a roadside bomb exploded outside a military camp in a town near Mogadishu that Islamist militant group Al-Shabaab claimed responsibility. The blast in Afkoye, about 30 kilometers southwest of the capital, took place a day after the insurgent group carried out a raid on the same town that was repulsed by government troops. Meanwhile, Kenyan authorities say Kenyan soldiers working under the African Union mission in Somalia, Amisom, killed seven al-Shabaab fighters in a Somali district on the country's border. African diplomats, uh, foreign ministers and heads of state are beginning to arrive at the African Union headquarters in Ethiopia. Uh, they have a lot on their plate for this year's African Union summit, uh, top among them choosing the next year person of the continent's body. Anita Powell has more from Johannesburg. With these words, I wish to once again with all humility as African heads of state look at big issues across this continent this year's African Union summit, they also need to make a big internal decision. They need a new leader. AU Commission Chairwoman Nkosa Zana Dlamini Zuma is on borrowed time after heads of state extended her term. The hot issue is electing a new chairperson for the African Union Commission. It was postponed last year, and really heads of state can't wait another six months to get a consensus. That's uh, top of the agenda. Other issues include stopping the ethnic violence in South Sudan and rescuing the country's crumbling peace process. Also, the ongoing humanitarian crises and conflict in Somalia and the Lake Chad Basin. The continuing debate over the International Criminal Court is one area where the new AU chairperson could set the tone, especially as three African countries plan to leave the ICC. There is very limited access to justice in Africa. If, um, if there's a particular president or a senior official who remains in office indefinitely, 20 years, 22 years in the case of Yahya Jame, um, where can those victims in those countries seek access to justice. The only place that you could potentially seek access to justice is from the International Criminal Court. The political standoff in the Gambia is over. Jame has left. But open society campaigner Jegan Gray Johnson says that there's still unfinished business in the tiny West African nation. And he intends to push the AU to confront Jame's alleged crimes. Um, at some point in time, there has to be consequences for such actions and such attempts at entrenching impunity. And on top of all of this, the AU must decide whether to allow this 54-member body to become 55. Morocco quit in 1984 after the AU recognized the independence of Western Sahara from Morocco. The yeah, AU can do with a little help now that Libya, which used to be one of the biggest funders, is no longer supporting the AU. So um, in many ways, um, the AU could benefit from Morocco, but um, there are many countries who strongly feel that uh, the Western Sahara issue is one of uh, occupation, um, it needs to be independent. It's an ambitious agenda for the 54-year-old organization and its leaders, who have just days to tackle these many issues. But as the AU has long said, this is about coming up with African solutions to African problems. Anita Powell, VOA News, 
Johannesburg. Well, the past year has seen the World Food Program make uh, drastic cuts to food rations for people in need across Africa as crises around the globe compete for donor money. In the Central African Republic, two million people, that's half of the population, need food aid. But the WFP says it is able to assist a little over 600,000 of them. Zach Badoff reports from the city of Bambari. The World Food Program distributes monthly rations to hundreds of thousands of displaced families in the Central African Republic. In Bambari alone, the WFP feeds more than 100,000 people. Mayor Matthew Bataban says most are seeking safety from fighting between armed groups. These people left their villages, they abandoned everything. They abandoned their manioc fields. They abandoned the maize fields that allowed them to survive. Because they are far from their fields, they have no revenue. This creates a real problem for food. Virginie Kada brought her eight children here last April after her husband was killed. The children eat from the gardens, but once that's finished, it will be difficult to get food, and I'm worried my kids will become malnourished. Due to funding shortfalls, the WFP has been forced to cut rations here by 75%. Nothing to eat. Here, when they come to distribute, it's terribly insufficient. It is terribly insufficient. I have five children and five orphans and my mother. I suffer a lot. 24-year-old Rumiard Mbiambanga goes into the bush to collect wood to sell in the market. He uses the money to supplement their rations. But it's dangerous work. Armed groups still roam the area. Because of the security problems, where can we search for work? It's not safe, so we can't walk. We can't go find work anywhere. We are always here. And it's a vicious cycle that the CAR has been trapped in for years. Camp leaders worry that lack of food and jobs may only push more men to join armed groups as a way to survive. The CAR government is appealing to large donors, including the United States and the European Union, to step in with funding so food rations can be increased. Zach Badorf for VOA News, Bambari, in the Central African Republic. Here in Washington, D.C., the U.S. Senate continued Monday to fill President Trump's national security team by confirming his pick for CIA Director Republican Congressman Mike Pompeo. Confirmed by an overwhelming vote of 66 to 32, Pompeo joins Defense Secretary John Mattis and Homeland Security Secretary John Kelly in their fledgling Trump administration. Vice President Mike Pence administered the oath of office to Pompeo after the Senate confirmation vote. The men and women serving under your command uh, give true meaning to the word courage. They often put their lives on the line and often in great obscurity. And they have the admiration of the President of the United States uh, and the gratitude of the American people. And I know they will be greatly benefited uh, by the wealth of experience and character that you will bring. Well, Pompeo had criticized the Obama administration for ending so-called enhanced interrogation techniques. But at his confirmation hearing last week, he promised to follow U.S. law on the treatment of detainees. Uh, meanwhile, the Senate Foreign Relations Committee approved President Trump's nomination of Rex Tillerson as Secretary of State. Uh, Tillerson's tenure as CEO of ExxonMobil proved to be a partisan point of disagreement as to whether he is good choice to be America's top diplomat. President Donald Trump's White House spokesman vowed Monday that the new administration intends never to lie to the news media. Press Secretary Jean Spicer's comments uh, came in the wake of a brewing clash between the new president and the journalists assigned to cover him during the first few days of his administration. VOA national correspondent Jim Malone has the latest from Washington. 
Good afternoon, everyone. Thank a less confrontational White House press secretary, Sean Spicer, uh, held his first that, briefing with questions that, Monday. Well. It came two days after Spicer uh, accused the media of uh, deliberately uh, misreporting uh, the size of the crowd at President Trump's inauguration Friday, including claims that were contradicted by photos and unofficial estimates. On Monday, Spicer was asked directly if he and the administration will tell the truth. Yes, I believe that we have to be honest with the American people. I think sometimes we can disagree with the facts. There are certain things that um, we may miss, we may not fully understand when we come out, but our intention is never to lie to you, Jonathan. Spicer stood by the assertion that the Trump inauguration was the most viewed of all time, including those watching on television and those streaming online. The dispute over crowd size was initially brought up by the president himself during a visit to CIA headquarters on Saturday. I made a speech. I looked out. The field was, it looked like a million, a million and a half people. They showed a field where there were practically nobody standing there. Trump also used the occasion to blast the news media. I have a running war with the media. They are among the most dishonest human beings on earth. <laughs> Concerns about the questionable administration claims intensified Sunday when Trump advisor Kellyanne Conway tried to deflect criticism on NBC's Meet the Press. You're saying it's a falsehood and they're giving Sean Spicer, our press secretary, gave alternative facts to that. Even some conservatives are alarmed at the growing tensions between the administration and the press, says political analyst Michael Barone. I think many people in the press think that Trump is a dangerous and potentially dictatorial character. Uh, I think those fears are overwrought, but I think there are things to be concerned about there as well. Trump supporters have long been suspicious of the mainstream media, says political uh, analyst would, Larry Sabato via Skype. Uh, as always, as we learned during the campaign, Trump's followers will believe absolutely anything he says, and if they don't, they simply don't care. Spicer acknowledged Monday that there's lingering resentment among Trump supporters over coverage of last year's presidential campaign. I think over and over again, there's this constant attempt to undermine his credibility and the movement that he represents, and it's frustrating. Spicer's less confrontational tone Monday and his vow to be truthful could diffuse some of the tension stemming from what has been a rocky start in the relationship between the 45th president and the news media. Jim Malone, VOA News, Washington. Pro-immigrant groups are mobilizing to get ahead of expected Trump administration orders regarding immigration and refugees. Trump supporters say the Obama administration went too far and the new president's plans will restore the status quo. VOA's Caroline Prasuti has the story through the eyes of a Syrian refugee. Omar al Mukdad is a wanted man. The Syrian government has three execution orders for him. His crime? Criticizing President Bashar al-Assad. Today he walks freely in a cafeteria at the U.S. Capitol. How are you doing? Just one coffee? al Mukdad came to this country as a Syrian refugee. Now he's worried other Syrians won't get protection in the United States because of fears a terrorist will be among the group. I can't just paint five million refugees with a singular brush and say, no, we can't have them because there is one guy out there, we don't know who he is, we don't know how he looks, may come to the United States and blow himself up. That's not a rational, responsible way of thinking. Dan Stein of the Federation for American Immigration Reform disagrees. He says the U.S. can't entirely vet the backgrounds of people coming from war zones. The best way to protect the most number of people is to help them temporarily where they are in hopes of eventual repatriation and the situation calms down in Syria. Third country resettlement in a country like the U.S. should be a last resort option. At Monday's news conference, Press Secretary Sean Spicer said President Trump's immigration priorities are building a wall on the southern border and evicting illegal immigrants with criminal records. People who have overstayed their visas, people who have committed crime, and we're going to go through that in a very systematic and methodical way. But immigration advocates worry the administration will deport all illegal immigrants, including those who arrived as children, like Mexican Grace Martinez. 
Martinez, who is protected under President Obama's Dreamer Act. Although Donald Trump may choose to call me criminal and call my parents criminal, I believe that we are heroes. But Stein says protecting Dreamers is inherently unfair. Barack Obama created a constitutional crisis and tried to draw a line in the sand that didn't exist. Now he's put Donald Trump in the position of having to explain arbitrarily why one person falls on one side of the line and one person falls on the other. Executive orders can be issued for some policy changes. The others will face an attack by Democrats in Congress, led by Senator Chuck Schumer. The Trump administration is on notice. We will not waver. We will not tire. Al Mukdad is here legally. In fact, he can apply for American citizenship starting next month. Carolyn Prasuti, VOA News, Washington. Well, I want to know what you think about Africa 54 and the stories we cover. Join the conversation on Facebook. The address is Africa 54. And check out our headlines 24-7 on voaafrica.com. Find me on Twitter at VOA Vince McCory. Coming up, the United Nations launches an appeal for more fans to combat international humanitarian crisis. Stay with us. From science and technology, here's What's New. What's New? An electric motorbike built from scratch by students at Eindhoven University of Technology in the Netherlands. The touring bike called Stormwave relies entirely on battery power. With 24 individual batteries packed in modular canisters on the side of the bike for easy access and replacement. Eindhoven's Bosfer Cake says this system is more versatile. When we face those bad roads, we just took, for example, half of the batteries out. We have a lighter motorcycle, a lower sense of gravity, which makes it easier to handle. Stormwave can go 400 kilometers on one charge, and Eindhoven's Jorik Heidemann says the motorbike also has a little kick to it. With our motorcycle, it can go from zero to 100, like under five seconds. Last November, students riding two Stormwave motorbikes completed a world tour that took them through 17 countries and 65 cities, covering close to 21,000 kilometers. For VOA's What's New, I'm Todd Grossan. What joining us now is Africa 54 health correspondent, Lino Medu. Now, what do you have for us today, Lino? The United Nations has appealed for a record amount of $22.2 billion for its humanitarian operations in 2017. The humanitarian appeal is the culmination of a global effort to assess needs and decide collective response strategies by hundreds of organizations. The collaboration will deliver food, shelter, health care, protection and emergency education to people in conflict and disaster affected regions. The UN says the world is facing a state of humanitarian crisis crisis not seen since the Second World War. 80% of the needs stem from man-made conflicts. At the same time, the impact of El Nino triggered droughts, floods, and extreme weather is pushing vulnerable communities to the brink of survival. Stephen O'Brien is the UN Under Secretary General for Humanitarian Affairs and Emergency Relief Coordinator. Funding for 2017 will translate into concrete actions such as life-saving food assistance for people on the brink of starvation in the Lake Chad Basin and South Sudan, protection of the most vulnerable people fleeing conflict in Syria and Iraq, vital health and medical care in Yemen, education for children whose schooling is disrupted by El Nino, psychosocial support and protection for 439,000 children in Libya, health services to some 6.5 million people in Nigeria. And of course, much, much more. $22.2 billion is the largest request by the organization since the yearly call was established in 1991 and is 700% higher compared to the first interagency appeal 25 years ago. Now, researchers from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health have genetically modified mosquitoes to resist infection from dengue virus. 
the researchers manipulated a component of the immune system, the JAK-STAT pathway, in the Aedes aegypti mosquito that carries the dengue virus. As a result, fewer mosquitoes became infected, and most of those that did had very low levels of dengue virus in their sal salivary glands, the location from which it gets transmitted to humans. The research shows it is possible in the lab to boost the natural ability to fight the dengue virus as a first step towards suppressing its ability to spread the disease. The research was published in the journal Plus and Neglected Tropical Diseases. Dengue virus sickens an estimated 96 million people globally each year and kills more than 20,000 mostly children. Dengue is part of the Neglected Tropical Diseases, or NTDs, a diverse group of tropical infections which are especially common in low-income populations in developing regions of Africa, Asia, and the Americas. For more on NTDs, joining us via Skype from Seattle, Washington, is Dr. Julie Jacobson, counselor with the American Society of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene. Dr. Jacobson, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Pleasure to be here. Now, would you give us a sense of where we stand in the fight against dengue fever? Uh, dengue has been an expanding uh, global infection, and its actual reach has been increasing over the past several years. So the urgency to find uh, effective ways to address dengue and to contain it and the, uh, and the morbidity that it causes is really a high priority. <clears throat> where do we see hope? In, we saw that uh, earlier I spoke about a research to modify mosquitoes. Where do you see the hope to be able to make progress? I think there's a couple different areas for, for dengue. I think the most exciting pieces that are coming forward right now are related to the mosquitoes. Uh, the report that you uh, you just gave on the on the dengue mosquitoes, but there's also a piece that's looking at bacteria that are a symbiotic relationship within the mosquito that putting in a, 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 a different kind of a Wolbachia, it's a kind of bacteria, also alters the mosquito's ability to carry the virus, but it doesn't necessarily kill the mosquito, so it doesn't have as many environmental uh, uh, concerns with it has shown a great promise for that and both Zika. So I think some very exciting things around mosquitoes, um, some advances in uh, vaccine related work, and then uh, improving access to care for those that are infected. Now let's talk about another NTD, Guinea worm disease. Earlier this month, it was reported that uh, it, it has been eliminated in Mali. Where do we stand when it comes to the global eradication? Uh, guinea worm is a, a very exciting and challenging story. So guinea worm eradication is making great progress. Um, there were about 25 cases uh, last year in, in the world, uh, and those come from three remaining countries, Ethiopia, South Sudan, and, uh, Ma uh, and uh, uh, Chad. And the very exciting news is that Mali has had one year now with no reported cases in humans. And so that's very promising that they will successfully have achieved the elimination target and move us closer to eradication, which would be a great accomplishment for mankind, for one of the, uh, from some, some of the populations that are most marginalized on the planet. Now, looking, looking ahead, uh, within the next five years, do you have any hope of any of the diseases that will be eradicated completely? Yeah, I think that, you know, amongst the NTDs, we have some of uh, the, the greatest accomplishments in global health that are very much unknown for much of the world because they don't affect most of the Western countries. Um, within that family of diseases, we have um, uh, lymphatic filariasis, which is also called elephantiasis, causing huge swelling of, of limbs um, that's transmitted by a mosquito. Uh, huge progress has been made in that, and actually six countries have already uh, been verified to or validated to have eliminated transmission, and 18 more no longer require uh, treatment, and there's over 300 million people that no longer uh, need to be treated for the disease. So great progress there. We're on track for uh, eliminating uh, within the next 10 years for that disease, and so it's very exciting. Um, in river blindness is another one with some great progress going for it uh, for elimination. In one word, what would you say is the most challenging in addressing NTDs right now, in one word? Conflict. I think your show has been showing that. Uh, yes. Conflict, huge challenge. Well, Dr. Jacobson, thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. And that was Dr. Julie Jacobson. She's counselor with the American Society of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene. And that's our show for today, our health report, rather, for today. So stay in touch for more. Find me on Twitter, at Lenore Moudou. Back to you, Vincent. All right, don't end the show yet. Thank you very much, Lenore.
For joining us today, now be sure to watch uh, Lino Medusa every Tuesday and Thursday for the latest health news in Africa right here on Africa 54. It's time now for a short break. See to come on Africa 54. Carnival rehearsals get underway in Rio. We'll be right back. If you've just joined us, I'm Mariama Diallo, and here is a quick recap of today's headlines. Gambians say they hope for a better future after former leader Yaya Jame leaves the country and is now living in exile. Burundi begins releasing a quarter of its jail population under a mass presidential pardon, but some are concerned the government is just making room for more political prisoners. In Ivory Coast, Special Forces commander says that a lack of protective equipment hampered the response to the jihadist attack on seaside town of Kamba Sam in March 2016. Finally, in Egypt, a small Cairo restaurant serves free food and drinks to the homeless and those in need for an hour each day. That's all for today. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. Welcome back to Africa 54. I'm Heidi Adams Fitzpatrick. Let's take a look at what is trending this Tuesday. Movie studio Disney has revealed that the next Star Wars movie will be called Star Wars The Last Jedi. Disney has not released a plot details for this installment, but director Reed Johnson says it will immediately follow the 2015 release of Star Wars The Force Awakens. And in that movie, Luke Skywalker was revealed to be the last remaining Jedi and had gone into hiding. Theories about the plot made the hashtag The Last Jedi the top trending item on Twitter on Monday with some 152,000 tweets in just one hour. Disney has yet to release any trailers. Well, to the Middle East now, and it's a trend considered haram in Arab countries, but it's growing in popularity. Over the past few years, tattoos have started to become increasingly popular amongst young Muslims in Jordan. The prophetic hadith, which reports the words and actions of the Prophet Muhammad, condemns any attempts to change the creation of, of God. That includes your body, of course. So tattoos are considered an alteration and a sin under Sunni Islam. Some think the tattoo trend is due to the rise of social media in the country. It's also allowed people to connect around the world and share knowledge, ideas and designs. And finally... Well, dozens of dancers and musicians from Rio de Janeiro Samba schools have started rehearsals for the 2017 Carnival Parade. Performers began preparing as early as September last year, but it was the first time some of the groups had a chance to rehearse in the Samba Drome. Brazilian Carnival officially starts on February 24th. It goes until Ash Wednesday on March 1st. That is definitely on my bucket list. And that is what is trending today. Vincent, it's back to you. Thank you. I thought you were going to pull one uh, samba dance there. And now that's our show for today. Be sure to watch Africa 54 on our website at voaafrica.com. For more news, tune in to VOA's evening radio show Africa News Tonight. They did 1800 UTC and in the morning today break Africa between 0, 300 and 0, 0600 UTC Monday through Friday. Thanks a lot for watching. Have a good night. Welcome to the Voice of America's News Words. This news word has to do with who is chosen or appointed for high-level jobs, especially government jobs. Cronyism. Critics say Myanmar, also known as Burma, will continue to be tainted by allegations of cronyism and corruption. Cronyism is the practice of placing friends or associates in important positions 
without concern for their qualifications. A crony is a word for an old friend. When cronyism decides who gets limited resources, it is seen as very unfair. Find more news words on our website.